there is a sadness, a melancholy that comes when looking at the ghost towns of a gold rush. It's elusive, but it's there, almost as though the memories of the long-forgotten people that lived and worked on these grounds are reaching up, reaching out and saying something, perhaps a warning. What was it all for, this, these holes, these empty shops, these crumbling houses, these lonely graves, this despoiled countryside. In 1892, two prospectors set out from the Southern Cross on a journey 150 miles to the east. Their names are Arthur Bailey and William Ford. They were like many of the prospectors of the time, fossicking about Travelling from one place to the next, a speck of gold here, a speck there. Except that on this journey, Arthur Bailey was heading for one particular place. Where there are prospectors and miners, there are stories of gold mines, and Bailey must have heard hundreds of these tales. But one of these stories he decided to believe. An old prospector named Macpherson had told him four years earlier of a place near Mount Burgess where he had nearly perished through lack of water. He told Bailey that though he was nearly half dead, he had sensed the presence of gold in the area and was convinced it was rich. Why Bailey should have believed the tale of an old prospector we do not know. But in 1892 Bailey and his partner set out heading east in search of a fortune. Gold was going to be the magic ingredient, the catapult that would suddenly fire the imagination of peoples to come to this foreboding third of Australia. It was really quite simple. It had worked in California and Eastern Australia. People would rush in their thousands to mine gold. What was needed here was a gold rush. Unlike other gold rushes where gold was found accidentally and gold rushes followed uncontrollably, oh no, this was going to be organised. But first they had to find a gold field. This would be done by offering a reward of £5,000 for the discovery of gold in payable amounts. But that did little. It aroused curiosity but unearthed no metal. What was needed was an expert. So the colonial officials set about to find one. In 1862, Edward Hargraves was appointed official gold finder of the colony of Western Australia. Hargraves had gained his experience in the Californian gold rush of 1849. 
he returned to New South Wales, convinced that the ground in California was similar to that of Eastern Australia and that there could be gold here too. He was correct on both accounts. Within three months of his return to Australia, he had found gold. It was this reputation that encouraged the colonial government of Western Australia to seek Edward Hargreaves' help. He searched for six months in the southwest corner and then announced that there was definitely no gold to be found in the colony. He sailed away, leaving the colonials mortified. They needn't have been, for Hargraves was wrong. Arthur Bailey was 26 years of age when he and his 40-year-old partner, William Ford, set out from Southern Cross in search of gold. All they had was the story of an unsuccessful prospector who believed in an area he had once seen while delirious with thirst. It was a place where explorers had passed before, yet they had seen nothing of the precious mineral. Bailey and Ford left in June 1892 with five pack horses and a supply of food and water to keep themselves alive in the relentless Western Australian desert. They travelled due east. The days were warm and the nights cold. At a spot 125 miles from Southern Cross and 25 miles from their destination, they camped. The horses were set free to forage for food. The following morning, Ford was rounding up the horses when something caught his eye. It was gold. The two men had found their gold field. Gold waiting to be picked up. I think we were more excited with that little bit of gold than any we found afterwards. That day we picked up about 80 ounces.
And just as they were mentally spending their newfound wealth, they were jarred back to reality. Nearby, a mining claim. It was a tin plate nailed to a peg. It was dated 1888, four years earlier. Why hadn't this claim been lodged? In a gully close to the claim lay the answer. The skeletons of two men speared by aboriginals. But Bailey and Ford were more fortunate. The winter weather kept them safe. It was lucky for us that it was wet, as the blacks made for the outback, where the feed as well as the water was plentiful. Though we had very wet weather, and had to sleep in wet blankets for more than a month. In spite of the weather, they continued to unearth gold, ever aware that they had not pegged nor registered their claim. Their greatest fear now was not from the aboriginals, but from fellow gold hunters. Ford recorded how their secret was nearly found out. One afternoon, up came a party of four men with a black boy. I knew two of them, Jack Ridey and German Charlie. We asked them to stop, as we could get colours of gold, and it would only take a few more days to prospect the country and then we could all go on together. They would not stay, and when we saw the last of them, we threw up our hats. On September the 17th, 1892, Arthur Bailey entered the mining warden's office and threw onto the table 554 ounces of gold. Within hours, the great Western Australian gold rush was on. It was California all over again. The word was out, the streets were lined with gold. And they were. Some even took to cutting nuggets with axes. It was California again, gold for the finding, gold for the taking, gold for the people to find and gather. It peppered the landscape. Tens of thousands of them came from the four corners of the globe to the great Coolgardie rush. In they streamed from Britain, the United States, Europe, New Zealand, Africa, and Japan. It was a gold rush of the people, 
not companies and engineers, but of people. And at this place, they started. Picking, digging, scratching, working. 3,000 ounces of precious gold won from the earth in the first weeks. Suddenly there were ships, sailing ships, steamships, jamming the harbour of Fremantle loaded with fortune seekers, all answering to the cry of gold. Japanese jostled with Americans and Britishers tripped over New Zealanders and South Africans, all in the eastern rush to the gold fields. And then, how to get there. Up there, to the gold fields, 350 miles inland, through dry desert wilderness. For 350 miles, they followed this track. They rode horses, drove camels, peddled bicycles, and walked. Some pushed wheelbarrows, others enjoyed wagons and coaches. Into the desert plains of Western Australia to take part in one of the last great gold rushes. A chance to make a fortune from the riches of the earth. They would put up with freezing cold, scorching heat, disease and discomfort, hardship and worry, unbelievable pain and suffering, uneatable food and undrinkable water, and all because of a yellow metal. An influx of people would take the colony of the Swan River out of obscurity and thrust it into the headlines of the world. Gold would be the dream of many, a golden dream of endless wealth. They were blinded by gold. The place of Bailey and Ford's find was named Coolgardie, from the Aboriginal Coolgur and Biddy and two Kulgade swarmed the gold seekers of the world. stopped. It had run out. Not the gold, but the water. As December approached, the water, hidden in the desert rock catchments, gave out. Gold there was plenty, water there was little. 
For those first prospectors in the gold rush of 1892, it was a bitter blow. But that's how it would be, out here in the Australian desert. Then out of this chaos of 15,000 people emerged the organization of a town. Where there is gold, there is money. And where there is money, there is business and enterprise. Out of the desert claim that Bailey and Ford lodged sprang the town of Coolgardie. 26 hotels, three stock exchanges, two breweries and seven newspapers. Robinco coaches were shipped in to form a regular passenger service. As were the camels and their drivers from Afghanistan. Of all that was rushed to this desert goldfield, only the camels were really at home. They brought in water, the supplies, and equipment, and the people. It was a town kept alive by camels. Trains of up to 100 camels, laden with packs and crates, would cross the desert bushland, travelling for days without water. Their drivers, working for three pounds per month, happy to be with their camels, and leaving the gold scratching to the Europeans. They kept the field alive. It was their country. And this being camel country, the streets of Coolgarde were made twice as wide to allow the teams to turn around. Camels can't walk backwards, but their drivers had to, once a day towards Mecca.
For hundreds of square miles they filtered the earth of its gold. In the heat of summer and the chill of winter, handful by handful, tossing each scoop in a tin dish. Blowing away the dust, shuffling away the grit, sifting up the stones, shaking loose the soil, until only the specks of gold dust were left. Square mile after square mile, the countryside was cleaned. For the majority, it was barely worth the effort. What money they collected from gold was soon spent in staying alive. Food was expensive. An egg was a luxury to be bought with gold. The price of horses increased tenfold and water cost two shillings a gallon. The salary earned for a week's work, digging the hard earth by hand, blowing each pan full of soil by the wind or with the human breath, could be lost or spent in a few minutes. Coolgardie was there to provide for the needs of the prospectors, but at a terrible price. And as the surface gold ran out in one area, they would slowly drift back into the town of Coolgardie and wait for the next find. Then off they would scramble to search and dig again. Thousands streamed into the gold fields and as Coolgardie grew, its problems increased. Disease cut down men, women and children. Typhoid, dysentery, scurvy. Others simply perished in the outback, caught without food or water, while hundreds more fell victims of despair, caught penniless, perhaps thousands of miles from their homeland, with no means to return. Then there were others who did not wish to return, and were kept alive by the thought of that big strike, the break, the lucky find. One was Paddy Hannan, an Irishman and a completely unsuccessful prospector. He and his partners set out from Coolgardie in June 1893. They were heading for a rise 50 miles to the east called Mount Ewell, but they never reached it. About halfway to Mount Ewell, they stopped to search for water and instead found traces of the yellow metal. Within days, they had picked up seven pounds of gold. Hannon was unresentful of the stampede that followed. Well, I started for Coolgardie to apply for a prospecting claim. This was June the 17th, and on the following day, which was Sunday, the news of our find got abroad. There were 1,400 to 1,500 men here within a week. A new town was born. This was to be called Kalgoorlie. Kalgoorlie and Coolgardie, 24 miles apart, sister camps in isolation. 350 miles from nowhere, sitting on paddocks of gold.
Within a few years, these rocky outcrops in the desert would become two cities rivaling in population the colonial capital of Perth. By 1896, in its fourth year of existence, Coolgardie bustled with a population of 32,000 people. While two years later, her golden rival, Kalgoorlie, boasted 25,000 souls. But by this time, the gold rush of the people was nearing its end. The surface earth had been picked clean. Gold was still there, but deep underground. From the lone prospector and miner, the mining companies took over. It would now take the investors' money of the London Stock Exchange and the mining techniques of the American West to burrow deep into the Earth's core for the veins of gold. The prospectors and their families would stay, but now as mine employees. While they drilled and carved into the rock of the West Australian desert, the stock market of London went berserk with speculation. Gold fever hit the market. Western Australia, a second California. Eighteen ninety two, sixty thousand ounces. Eighteen ninety three. 110,000 ounces. 1894, 207,000 ounces. 1897, 600,000 ounces. And 1899, 1,500,000 ounces of gold. By 1895, 342 companies had attracted 34 million pounds from investors. And even the swindlers and hoaxers failed to halt the clamour for shares in this unbelievable wealth. It was madness, the world was hypnotised. One who was caught was a British Earl. He became excited about a mine that had been uncovered by a young man named Mills. It started in 1894 here in this rough country, about 12 miles south of Coolgarde. A Mills with five young friends, all down on their luck, stumbled by chance on the unbelievable. They'd been prospecting and one day Mills just started idly kicking at a boulder near his feet. I noticed there was a gleam when I knocked off a piece of rock. Stooped over to take a squint at it, and by God, there she was. I jumped up and began smashing into the rock all around. Every lump was lousy with gold. In a few weeks, the six men had won almost 10,000 ounces of gold from a hole no more than five feet long and four feet deep. When the news broke, Coolgardie was spellbound. Within hours, every square inch around the find had been pegged. And among the speculators and promoters, a race to buy the lease. They named the mine Londonderry. Mills was to say later that after a while the sight of gold grew positively hateful. So monotonous and hard was the toil associated with its extraction. The six were under incredible pressure to sell. Eventually, they gave in to a syndicate represented by Lord Fingal. They sold the London Dairy for £180,000. In March 1895, Lord Fingal opened the mine. It was empty. 
The magic, not to mention the gold, had gone. It was found to be only a rich pocket, a freak of nature. But then, that was the gold business. Gold had built a city in the desert of Western Australia, the city of Coolgardie. It had enjoyed a brief moment of glory, less than ten years, then it started to slowly slide back into the sands of the desert. But its sister city, Kalgoorlie, survived. For there, below the surface, lay a second treasure, locked unseen in the grey stone, one thousand, two thousand, 3,000 feet below the streets. But this was beyond the reach of the people. The people's gold rush was over. If they wished to stay, it would be a servant to the mining companies of London. For the wealth that was locked in the ground below Kalgoorlie could only be won by machines. There is a sadness, a melancholy that comes when looking at the ghost towns of a gold rush. It's elusive, but it's there, almost as though the memories of the long-forgotten people that lived and worked on these grounds are reaching up, reaching out and saying something, perhaps a warning. What was it all for, this? These holes, these crumbling houses, these empty shops, these lonely graves, this, this despoiled countryside. For now it's all dead. The people gone, the metal gone. All that is left are these holes and these ruins. Almost as though an army of giant ants suddenly arrived and just as suddenly disappeared. It was a gold rush. <laughs> 